we're back in the dairy bush and we're talking with Gwen Govers, who is a master student, very nearly finished master student at uh, University of Waterloo. <laughs> and her thesis has been taking place in woodlots and in different kind of forested areas across this region. And she's going to tell you a little bit about uh, the questions that she's been looking at in these fragmented forests. Right. So the major uh major focus of my project is looking at garlic mustard invasion in Ontario and I guess the rest of the eastern seaboard really since it's everywhere. Um, but the big thing with this plant is that it produces a chemical that essentially poisons um, forest floor like fungi that other plants need to survive. mutualism that the fungi and the plants are mutually beneficial to each other and without each other they don't grow. Um, so we've been finding that some plants seem to be resistant to um, being killed off by garlic mustard coming in and one of them seems to be this guy here, bloodroot. Um, and Everybody say hooray for yeah. bloodroot. Yeah, so one of the big reasons for this we've been looking at several factors, one of which we think is because bloodroot is like the first thing to come up in the spring. So it's just, it can outshade the garlic mustard early on in the year. Though at the same time, garlic mustard also comes up really, really early. So it's just another reason why it's so competitive. Um, but the big thing my project's been looking at is that bloodroot, as the name implies, it's got this red, thick rhizomous root that produces another chemical called sanguinarine, which is just related to the Latin name of the plant. Um, but we're finding it's, there's a lot of literature on how it's antifungal and antibacterial and that kind of thing. Nobody's really looked at how it affects other plants. Um, so I'm kind of looking at that, but I've been, preliminary findings are indicating that it can kill off some of the seeds of garlic mustard, not all of them, but a good chunk of them, and especially since garlic mustard puts out like 5,000 seeds per plant a year, uh, even taking out a small number of them is something. So it's a good thing to do that. So yeah, this is the second year plant of garlic mustard. Um, we've got some of the seed pods going here, though they're not mature yet. Um, but in each one of these little pods is gonna be like 20 or 30 seeds, so. You can see even with this one tiny little plant, there's going to be a ton of seeds just even in that. And this is the first year one, fairly small, not in innocuous. Um, but they spread like crazy. And yeah. So. Uh, so do you know uh, from your thesis in the background reading kind of when, when and where it was introduced? Uh, like so, how long has it been part of our, it's clearly part of our forests now. Yeah. So. There's a little bit of literature on it. The first kind of sightings were mid-1800s. Uh, there was a paper recently that came out, and I can't remember the authors off the top of my head, unfortunately, but there's been several introductions from Europe, but the genetics are most closely matched to the type of garlic mustard that grows in southern England and Ireland. Hmm. So mid-1800s, and in Ireland kind of has kind of paints the picture of it having to do with the Irish potato famine and having all those Irish people immigrating to North America. And the, the fact that this plant is also edible kind of helps with that theory. Um, because we, we Irish were eating everything at that yeah, point. Yeah, essentially. And it's, it grows in the ditches everywhere in Ireland. So, um, yeah, just the fact that you could pocket a couple seeds and they would probably grow even so it, it years, could, like, fine. we know with lots of North American, either introductions to North America from Asia or from Europe or different places, that there's some of them that are very, we can, we know who did it because they intended to do it. Whereas yeah. other times we know using genetics kind of where, secondarily we can infer where they've come from. But, so this one could have been intentional, mm -hmm. but we don't know. Is that... Yeah. yeah. So so it could have been accidental because they have these tiny seeds that... Co they kind of cling to everything. I've been finding them in my turned up... in my boots, in my turned up pockets and stuff like that on my pants.
mats, so they kind of cling to stuff. Yeah. But they don't really have those grabby things like um, uh, well, the burdock, like the burdock do. But they still they're just tiny and get in stuff. The Velcro hook. Yeah. yeah. But there's also seeing that it's edible. There's a pretty good chance that somebody brought some of it with them because they needed something to eat yeah. or just to flavor something with. <laughs> so. When you're looking at woodlots and forests around south, southwestern Ontario, are you finding are the, are you finding forests that do they all have it? Do some of them not have it? Do we're, they all have it to very various degrees? We're pretty much at a state in Ontario where most in southern Ontario at least where most forests at least have it on the the edges. Yeah. It's the ones where you're getting it as carpets throughout the entire understory that's the big issue because at that point you're not really having any other plant seeds coming back into the area to re bring other native plants so does that as so. a as an above ground proxy of disturbance to the soil is that a, is that a good one that yeah that's a it's a good indicator for that and it also i have a lab partner who's looking at it, the co-invasion of garlic mustard and earthworms and how that has to do with each other he's been trying to explain it to me but <laughs> well, because one of the things, maybe you guys all know, but like earthworms, what's a quick word about earthworms in this area? Yeah, they're all invasive. Yeah. Uh, they're all from Europe, and I think there's maybe like five of them from Asia or something, but yeah. there's all of our earthworms were killed off in the last ice age, so everything that you find around here isn't from here. <laughs> yeah. Which, uh, when I learned, that was a crazy thing for me to learn when I was, when I learned that, that that real visible part of the animal uh, community, none of it was from here. Yeah. So the other question that I had about the blood root was about their some of the, the seeds and some of the some of the interactions that both of these plants have with other species. So what, tell us about this. Alright, so this here is one of the uh, blood root seed pods. Actually I guess I can just open them up. They're not quite ready to go yet, but they're, they're supposed to pop about next week, so they're probably mature enough to come out at this point. Um, but they've got this little structure on the seeds. There's like probably like 50 or 60 seeds in there. Uh, but they've got this little fleshy bit on the side of the seed, and that's called an eliosome. Um, so essentially, the plant has produced this accessory organ to its seeds which mimic um, mimic essentially insect tissue uh, so it essentially attracts ants to come pick up these seeds and take them elsewhere so um, plants speaking to ants yeah using some kind of insect yeah so it's majorly I think it's uh, oleic acid but um, essentially just mimics what insect meat smells like cool so um, yeah, so they'll take this and eat the eliosome and then essentially just pitch the seed because they have no use for it. Um, but it tends to put the seed in a place where seed predators won't get to it. So there's a bunch of questions as to how that's beneficial. There's a couple hypotheses, but nothing really concrete at this point. So there'd be the kind of the, the purposeful movement, purposeful from the ant's perspective, eating it, moving it to where they've eaten it or en route to where they've eaten it and then dropping and maybe secondary kind of establishment of the plant once like this where uh, the elizum has been consumed and then the plant the seed offers nothing not much of anything to the ant and they move on. The other thing um, with these is that the, the ant were, think majorly does most of the dispersal is in the aphanogaster genus, um, and again, they're just carnivorous, they eat other insects, they don't really look much at plant tissue, um, but they also tend to be a fairly transient species, so they're using two or three different nests a year. So by the time they've dumped all these seeds off in a nest, they're probably moving on to their next nest. So you've got a nice nutrient-rich space where the seed can develop on its own. And so how might garlic mustard, so that's an interaction, that's kind of the interaction that is native to these, these forests in eastern North America. And how is the mustard seed, is that interfering with it, affecting it? That was part of what I was looking at, and 
Um, so we wanted to see if the garlic mustard was affecting where the ants were turning up and what they were doing. Uh, my preliminary research, at least with the aphanogasters, is finding that they don't seem to care, which is good for the blood root because they'll have their, their dispersal mechanism all over the place. Um, but there has been um, at least one paper out of Pennsylvania looking at that co-invasion between garlic mustard and earthworms and how earthworms can really drastically change the leaf litter composition and all that, um, which would affect where the ants are showing up. So. Very cool. Lots and of so questions. those are so that's like I said at the start. Your thesis, you're writing it right now, mm -hmm. and we'll submit it for publication and review and consideration of the primary literature. So what you just told them is like hot off the presses. Yeah. Not yet published. Right. Cool. You're in. <laughs> um, all right. Well, thanks a whole bunch for coming out in the. Uh, June of a mildly mosquito-y dairy bush as you yeah. collect some of your uh, materials from sampling from last year. And thanks for telling us about garlic mustard and bloodroot and interactions with ants and plants. Cool. Thank you. Great.